came over to, you know, they, they show up in Salem in the early 1600s. And um, <coughs> nowhere in there, in the records in Salem, is there any assertion about who their parents were. Back in England, there aren't any wills that were written to say, I give to William Chichester or James Chichester of Massachusetts or of Salem, Massachusetts, to, to make that clear connection. There's, there's none of that. All there are is, are there some birth records at the Woodworthy chapter uh, parish uh, in Devon County that show a William and Susanna being the parent of a William and a James were of about the right age to have arrived in Salem. And everything that, that happens to William and James are correct for their age. And that's about it. That's, that's, so that's the analytical kind of thing. The second thing is, is that the records of the Huntington Church, the records of births for Chichester, Chichester is in, in Huntington, New York, because that, you know, based on my research, I've pretty much drawn the conclusion that James Chichester left Salem and went up to Huntington. And well, he was, and then he ended up dying in Huntington. But the problem is, it wasn't until James Chichester the third that James's grandson was an old man or even died that uh, the church records at Huntington are even close to to um, to being <laughs> to being uh, sufficient to establish whose whose parents. And because uh, the church records don't say, they just say who was baptized, but they don't, they don't say who the parents are. And so you have to try to figure out, you have to look at each one of these people's lives, if there were any other records later on, and try, there's a bunch of Chichesters that show up there, almost <laughs> too much to, <laughs> to really believe it came from this one James Chichesters, they're all James Chichesters' descendants. But nonetheless, they're, they're there, and so the only real conclusion you can draw is they're probably ancestors of James Chichester because they were living in Huntington and they um, were baptized there. Well, that, that comes under the, the standard of a review, and, it, and the review means that of all the evidence that I've looked at, I can't say this is wrong. But I can't say it's right either. Okay, and there are some lines out there that are reviewed, and some are just compiled. They're just records put together with, <coughs> with um, now compiled just means records are just put together. There's been no examination of the underlying evidence whatsoever beyond the assertion that these two parents are the parent of an individual and, and, and siblings. Okay, so what tools do, do, do auditors and accountants actually have to look at records to figure out whether they're right or wrong? You, you think, okay, well, you got a birth certificate that establish it. Well, birth certificates weren't, <coughs> weren't exactly common back uh, before the 1900s. My own, two of my grandparents had to have, my grandfather had to have a sister, uh, sign a statement that my grandfather notarized himself saying that he was uh, uh, the son of Giuseppe uh, Leone and Maria Pulsanti born in 1905 but um, doesn't necessarily you know if you look from pure the pure sense of it doesn't really mean that he himself is an independent of the records so you gotta look at other evidence um, There's something called an arm's length transaction in accounting. And basically, what an arm's length transaction is is the fair market value. The you know if you're at you're, you're a reasonable person would be willing to pay the price for whatever item for, for whatever item he wants. And the person selling the item is willing to accept that money for whatever item he has. Okay. Well, fair market value doesn't really apply to genealogy, but the idea of arm's length does. So if you go out there and you look at records that are compiled at arm's length, it's, um, 
there, there's a good reason to rely on it, such as a lot of the tan books come out of Massachusetts. Um, vital records of all these various cities were published by the New England Historical Genealogical Society. They, they didn't have any incentive when they wrote those books to make up names because, you know, <laughs> a faked birth or death record isn't really going to please anybody. Uh, especially if the individual doesn't exist. There are also various concepts in accounting called existence and completeness that would apply to whether uh, the set of records um, amount to uh, something that's free of material misstatement. And the omission of siblings, uh, to me, would be a material misstatement. Now the reason why, now, audits don't ignore analytics, and analytics are a very important part of audits. And so, <coughs> when you have a set of siblings, and you have five siblings, all with birth dates, you, you know, you're going to notice that they're born one or two years apart for the most part. If you see one of the siblings born outside that range, or at least an auditor would look for a sibling born in a time and then there's a five-year gap and then they come back they're gonna need a, an explanation for that five-year gap well this and such and such was in, was in jail or whatever but or at war <laughs> or something like that but um, <coughs> nonetheless um, that's what that is so uh, a genealogical line that only lists father son father son wouldn't pass the muster of completeness. There is another concept of existence, that is, um, you know, certain children have been purportedly created as illegitimate children of royal lineages that, um, <laughs> for people's genealogical, there, there was one genealogist that was just horrible at that, he used to like to put people into their uh, medieval lines. <coughs> get them back, you know, going back to Adam and Eve. You know, any genealogy that purports to get back to Adam and Eve has a problem. Now, again, so you take all these various different concepts and skills and you can apply them, and this repository would say, okay, based on the evidence we have, um, this line is only, can only be certified to be a review. So for example, I have an ancestor named Charles Leap that was born uh, in Connecticut and he had some children in Delphi, New York, moved to Wisconsin, settled in Summers, and um, his daughter Jane married a man named William Everton Burgess, and then his, his great-granddaughter is actually my great-grandfather, great-grandmother. Now Charles Leap, unfortunately the birth records uh, for the church that he was supposedly born in in Connecticut were destroyed and he became estranged from his father before he died and so or vice versa his father abandoned the family and um, the best I could I, you know so his father's will doesn't have Charles listed in there uh, so far as I know and so <coughs> there's no real way to say that my ancestor Charles Lee was the son of Alan Lee, other than it, it makes sense in every possible way, <laughs> analytically, just like for the Chichesters. Now, if the analytics are strong enough, who knows? Uh, you can, you, uh, those factors will probably have to be laid out in, in the discussion on these lines that are called reviewed lines. But until it can be absolutely established, can you really say it's been audited? Can I say that Charles Lee being the son of Alan Lee is uh, an assertion that is free of material misstatement? I have reasonable assurance and I've examined sufficient competent evidence thereof. It's debatable. It really is. Um, so the next part is, is um, training genealogists to do their own brand of audits. Okay, and the third thing would be just having a body that would do one of two, uh, two, uh, two things. One, they would anything that passes an audit, they put it up there and it'd be available for sharing. 
along with the sources, and the second um, body would an actually handle disputes. And of course, there's going to be disputes, especially when analytics are, are involved. <coughs> now, there may be two analyzed lines that come to two completely different conclusions based on the evidence they have. And maybe put together, they might be able to establish a better, um, a better connection. Who knows? But um, so I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I'm gonna stop now, and then I'll pick up.